Governor Huntsman, first of all, thank you for the time. Honored. Thank you. Seeing you here in New Hampshire the last two days, you sure look and sound an awful lot like a candidate. Are you in? We're moving in that direction. We've got about all the boxes checked. You've got the organizing box. You've got the fundraising box. You've got the boots on the ground box. Then you've got the family box that is the last one. And we're about there, too. We'll probably have one more sit-down meeting this week, and then I think we'll be able to check that box. And what is it that you think you would bring to this race? You've talked a lot about the economy, specifically on the economy. What is it John Huntsman would bring to that debate? Knowledge of the private sector, which I think uh, over the years to come is going to be critically important. We need somebody who understands the environment that needs to be created for jobs. We need somebody who understands the fragility of the free market system. Uh, I've seen it. I've lived that. Number two, I think it's good to have somebody who's been in an executive position, uh, having run a state, but having run a state successfully, where you've got a track record that people can look to and say, oh, the hottest economy in the country, the best managed state in America. That's a pretty good track record. Three, I think knowledge of the world is very, very important. Uh, this world of ours isn't going to get any less confusing or murky in the years ahead. And to have somebody who understands foreign policy and national security policy, who's dealt uh, intimately with our largest trading partner uh, in the years to come and our uh, most significant emerging strategic challenge, I think is going to be very important. Now, Mitt Romney has suggested President Obama's economic policies have, have failed. Are you getting into this because you've reached the same conclusion? I'm getting into this because we're about to hand over a country with $14.2 trillion in debt, $100 billion in spending per month, 9.1 unemployment, and no relief in sight. This is the world, this is the country that we're handing down to the next generation. And for the first time in history, we're facing the prospect that the next generation, my kids, your kids, people's grandkids, are going to get a country the greatest nation that ever was uh, in the history of the world uh, that's less good, less capable, less competitive than the one we got. And I say that's totally unacceptable. And there's some things we can do to fix that. So you either stand on the sideline or you say, I'm going to do what Teddy Roosevelt uh, uh, advocated. You get in the arena and try to do something about it. And that's what brings us here. Some of the policy ideas on the table right now are certainly in discussion. Even in Washington right now, they're talking about a bipartisan deal potentially to deal with the $14.3 trillion debt. Should Republicans in that conversation be willing to put tax increases on the table? Is that what a President Huntsman would be willing no, to do? No, I don't, I don't think you grow your way to prosperity through tax increases. In fact, we're so fragile at this point in our economic recovery, if you can even call it that, that tax increases are going to stymie growth. Today, we need to look at both sides of the balance sheet. We need to look at the spending and debt side, but we also need to look at the revenue side. And the revenue side, I think, is going to be uh, uh, impacted and hindered by any tax increases. We learned this uh, out uh, running a state. You've got, to, you've got to create a framework and environment through tax reform, through regulatory reform, through what I think can be one of the most exciting options of all, and that's a true energy independence policy. Uh, that will allow for the economy to expand and jobs to be created in an environment that isn't uh, anti-growth. And today, we're just not finding that kind of output. We're not finding the innovations in Silicon Valley that are being spun out the other end with any high level of confidence. We're finding small businesses that can't get loans. We're finding companies are not willing to uh, release capital expenditure programs because of the uncertainty in the marketplace. So there's a lot that we can do. We're all going through this deleveraging exercise Every family, every business, big and small, every city, town, every state in our country. And as we deleverage, our balance sheets are going to get better over time. And we're going to be in a position, I'm here to tell you, in the years to come, where if we can couple uh, a healthier financial and economic uh, position on, on the balance sheet with a pro-growth agenda, we can launch another uh, industrial revolution in this country. There's a big issue on the balance sheet right now, and that's Medicare, of course. You've largely embraced Paul Ryan's plan. Tell me why. I have. I think it's realistic. Uh, he's actually offered a plan. You know, I don't consider uh, a, a campaign commercial where somebody gets dumped off a cliff to be uh, a solution. We're to the point in time, we can't wait a whole lot longer. We need solutions on the table that are realistic, that are honest, uh, and that are comprehensible. And I thought what he put forward on Medicare is, uh, is a good start. And uh, he's looking at for those below 55 years of age. This is a young, mobile, plugged-in generation. They want more in the way of options. They want more to choose from. I think they're realistic about future prospects. 
that the Medicare we talked about in 1965 uh, is, uh, was a much different set of uh, expectations than the Medicare we find today. So a voucher program okay by you? Well, I don't know if you'd call it a voucher program. Uh, he doesn't call it a voucher program, but I think uh, more in the way of flexibility, more in the way of options, more in the way of what Medicare Part D uh, uh, attempted to do, more in the way of what we've done in the state of Utah in terms of health care reform, where you've got a connector with a multiplicity of insurance options. People are in the driver's seat. They get to decide, and then they you know, have to live with those choices. Utah, a little bit of personal responsibility. Is Utah a national model here? Because there have been some questions raised, and certainly more people are covered. But health care costs have still continued to go up, have they not? Health care costs are driven by several different things. And I believe any talk about health care reform really does have to attack uh, health care costs. You, you figure it's a probably $2.5 trillion industry. And by most estimates, by the experts, up to half of that is probably wasted or superfluous spending. So how do you get at the cost part? How do you empower patients to know more about their procedures when they walk into the doctor's office and can choose between a $100 x-ray versus a $1,000 MRI, yet the results are the same? We've got to get to the point where transparency, empowering patients, harmonizing medical records, which will do a whole lot to overall health care costs. We first state to do it in Utah. Steps that we can learn not just from one state, but there are a lot of states that are looking at how to reform health care, how to tame costs, how to make it uh, more mobile and, and, uh, and portable, uh, how to create more in the way of choices. I think we need to take a step back, learn from what states are doing, learn from their experiences, and then have Washington say, okay, how do we help support and facilitate that kind of movement? The states are the incubators of democracy. They're going to come up with the solutions and the fixes. We just need to give them that opportunity. One thing that clearly differentiates you, you've talked about it a lot here over the last two days, your service in China. I want to get your sense. If there were to be a President Huntsman, how would policy towards China change? Would you take a tougher line with China? Well, you have to look at the last 40 years of the U.S.-China relationship, and it really has been a bipartisan approach for the most part. And that is we have economic interests, we have security interests, we have values that are part of this relationship. What is lacking in the U.S.-China relationship? And I would say that for 40 years we've done a pretty good job managing our shared interests. You know, any relationship can manage shared interests. That's trading, that's economics, it's investment, that's some regional security issues. The challenge ahead, and one where, if we were lucky enough, we would want to try to uh, create some greater value in the relationship, is to infuse more values into the U.S.-China relationship. We need more shared values. That's the glue that allows any meaningful bilateral relationship to last. So why do we do well with the U.K.? Why do we do well with Japan? Why do we do well with Australia? You can list a lot of other relationships that are based on shared values. Not just shared interests, but shared values. Friend or foe? And that's political reform, and it's, uh, it's recognition uh, of the role of uh, the Internet and, the, and what it does in, in access, uh, and it's about uh, human rights. Uh, a lot of things that would fall under that values banner. We need to infuse more of those into the U.S.-China relationship. And I believe that the next 10 and 20 years, if we are to succeed in getting it you know, beyond the 20,000 feet where it is today, this, this should be a 40,000 foot relationship, to use, an air, to, to use a flying analogy. Is it inevitable that China's economy overtakes the United States? Oh, I think in sheer size, that's, that's inevitable. You've got a large land mass. You have 1.3 billion people. You've got endless natural resources. You've got trade routes with the world that are secure and stable. Uh, you have a highly educated workforce. Um, you've got large traders within their neighborhood. So you've got all of the elements that would make for long-term economic growth. But will they catch us on a per capita basis? I'm not sure they ever will. It's one thing to catch a country in terms of overall output, you know, so we're at 15 trillion or 16 or 17. They too sometime will be at 15 or 16 or 17 trillion. But what does it mean on a per capita basis? You know, they're probably 75 to 100 years behind us as it relates to per capita uh, a GDP. And what about, you know, technology development and deployment? I'd say they're way behind in terms of their ability to indigenously generate uh, new technology, uh, uh, new innovations. We still lead the world in that. So general uh, GDP output, yeah, and I suspect India will be 20 years behind them. But in terms of per capita numbers, no, I'm not sure they're ever going to catch the United States. Yeah, Romney says to the business community, listen, I'm your guy. 
I've got the business background. You willing to challenge him on that? Oh, listen, we'll let, we'll let, <laughs> we'll let the voters decide. They'll have plenty of opportunities to look at all of us, the good, the bad, <laughs> the, the ugly, uh, where we've succeeded, where we haven't, uh, how we stack up uh, in the business world in terms of uh, our executive government responsibility, our international responsibility, uh, and then they can make a decision. Just finally, you worked for President Obama. You embraced cap and trade early on as a governor. You embraced civil unions. What's your message to Republicans who look at you in this field and say, this guy's too moderate to win the Republican nomination? I also worked for President Reagan. I worked for President Bush. I worked for President Bush. I am pro-life. I am pro-Second Amendment. We led the country in terms of tax cutting and tax reform. There's a lot there that I think uh, uh, conservatives will like and do like, or they wouldn't be migrating our way already. Is Barack Obama beatable? Oh, I, I, absolutely. With today's uh, economic uh, backdrop uh, and the difficulty that we're finding in getting any traction at all around uh, growth uh, in taming uh, our high unemployment, there are a lot, a lot of families uh, suffering in this country. There are a lot of families suffering in this state. Uh, I've been around and had conversations with a good many of them, and I've seen the remnants, the carcasses of the last Industrial Revolution that are just hollowed out. And I say, this country is pretty good at launching Industrial Revolutions. We've done so for almost 240 years. It's time we launch another Industrial Revolution. We need the right environment. We'll get that. But beyond that, we've got all of the elements for success. We have rule of law. We have con a constitution. Uh, we have the greatest research and development facilities in the world, the best colleges and universities, greatest hospitals, a resilient, innovative, entrepreneurial spirit in this country. We've got, we've got everything that any country would hope for in order to hit it out of the ballpark. We just don't have a plan. We don't have vision. We don't have the right leadership to get us there. And I fully anticipate that in the years ahead, these hollowed out carcasses that represent the old Industrial Revolution are going to be full of the new Industrial Revolution. If you that win, is my hope. If you win, can you promise a Harley in the White House driveway? <laughs> That's uh, no promise needed there. That's just going to happen whether I promise or not. That's just an automatic. Governor Huntsman, thank you for the time. A real Appreciate pleasure. Appreciate you joining us. Thank you.